my name is Matt Cameron. I am the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for PWRA in East Tennessee, uh, which just basically means I'm a PR guy. I get to do fun stuff like this and meet Alex Rudd. Of Alex Rudd fishing. Yes, sir. And uh, two things. All right, can I call you A Rudd? Absolutely. A Rudd. All right, I got that down. So, <laughs> all right, so A Rudd. Second thing is, how long have you been growing that awesome man man? Man, I tell you, I've not shaved my face since I was a senior in high school, and I graduated high school 10 years ago now. So I've had a beard forever. Um, beard at the length that it is now, I. Man, I don't know. I mean, it was a long time. It's kind of the brand now. You know what I mean? You, when you go on YouTube, when you go on Instagram, when you see my face, the beard is part of it. And so I've had the beard for a long time, man. Man, I'm, I have beard envy. Let me tell you, I got a couple things for you. Yeah. Uh, I have a beard care business and uh, ministry called John the Baptist Beard Care. If y'all can see that here, there's a uh, it's Sunday Best. It's kind of, kind of it's teak wooden leather, kind of cologne like, and this one's called Calvaria. It's uh, uh, food and uh, barbershop. Heck yeah, dude. Heck yes. Enjoy them. I will, Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's awesome, man. We'll get that, that out of the way. Thank y'all for taking time to let me do that. But, uh, so we got, uh, we could go anywhere with yep. this, and, and I, I'm going to let you talk about what you want to talk about. Yep. We've talked about some of the bodies of water that, that folks want to hear about, and mm -hmm. we have Norris and Loudon added to that list. So a lot of the southern toward the middle Tennessee part of East Tennessee yeah. and uh, up to north. So nothing Douglas Cherokee yet, but I'm sure we'll get around to those because that's where, where we're at. Yeah. So man, you, you take it away. You want to hear about summer bass fishing because you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of information online about bass fishing in general. But I want to try to get more specific about late summer. You get stuck yeah. to fish when the water gets hot, fish yeah. move and all that. And I, I couldn't go out and catch a fish right now because that's my life. So yeah. Yeah. Take, us, take us away with late summer bass fishing. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that you have to remember this time of year is that it's a transitional time. And transitions in nature, period, are tough on the animals that live in nature. But they're very instinctual. I mean, they are instinctual. Their entire, you know, drive in life is driven off their instincts and so there's things that start happening that we don't really notice happening first but the fish and all the other animals in the environment around them start to notice happening and you know it's at a cosmic level i mean literally the earth is starting to tilt away from the sun we're starting to get at a point in our path around the sun that you know it's the days are going to start shortening the temperatures are going to start dropping and right now, even though we're in late August and it's hot and it's, you know, we're all standing here sweating and it's humid and everything, as days are starting to shorten, that moon's starting to get a little bit lower in the sky, the sun's starting to get lower in the sky. And a bass, you know, being such a visual animal, um, learned this actually from one of your fishery, your guys' fisheries biologists, a bass's brain is almost 95 plus percent visual. So their entire life is driven by what they can see for the most part. You know, obviously they got their lateral line, which also helps them to feed and do all those kinds of things. But their vision drives them. So as soon as those days start to shorten, and as soon as that kind of photic period, which we talk about photic periods with like plants and stuff, but it can be applied to animals too. It's the amount of sunlight that the earth's getting. As soon as that starts to shorten, we don't really notice it because like we're living a day to day life where, you know, we walk outside and go, oh, it's hot, you know, it's still summer. Where the bass lives in an environment where it doesn't notice that as much. And so as soon as those days start to shorten, those instincts get hit that I need to start moving and start to get shallow and start to get ready for that transitional period that's coming. Okay, so they're going out more shallow. Exactly. The photo period short. Exactly. Okay. And, 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 and that's kind of you know where I was going is that as those days start to get shorter, those bass are going to start transitioning shallow. I never would have thought that. And, and, you know, and a lot of people don't, and, and it's it's kind of cool when you think about it, and if you just observe nature, period. I mean, even like if you got a pet dog or a pet cat, you'll notice this time of year they start doing different things. They start acting differently, and it's just because their entire little world that they live in is driven by an instinct, where we rationalize. We go, oh, it's hot. Oh, it's humid. Where a bass just goes, I need to eat and protect myself. And so to follow the food and to protect itself, it starts moving shallow to find that food. And then once it finds that food, it's going to find somewhere to be protected and to be able to ambush and be able to kill and to be able to eat. And so, yeah, I mean, this time of year, that's one of the things I, I definitely start focusing on. And that goes for any body of water. It doesn't matter if you're on a clear highland reservoir like Norris or if you're on a riverine system like Wattsville or Wild. It's just going to depend on those variables, you know, what body of water you're on, the, you know, what you're actually going to go look for and fish. But the main thing is to know in your mind that these fish are transitioning, that they are starting to move up shallow. Regardless of what we see is going on, their instinctual mind will start making them move long before we think it's time to move. 
Um, great example of this is I actually got the footage on my YouTube channel um, doing some jig fishing on loud and flipping jigs on grass lines. And, you know, a lot of the older guys and old men that I talk to that know a lot more about fishing than I do, and, you know, the guys I love to talk to that have been doing it a lot longer, they'll say, this time of year, man, you know, they start eating the bluegills for some reason. I don't know why they start eating the bluegills. Why the bluegills start moving up shallow? Same reason the bass move shallow. That instinctual drive to get up shallow, to feed up, to get ready for that transition, they'll be the first ones to move up there. They start using that grass. But wherever those bait go, where the food goes, you know, where the cheeseburgers are at, that's where the that's where the big fat belly kellys are going to show up to eat them. You My know dad says, I mean? find the bait, find the bait. Exactly, man, exactly. And so this time of year, like on Loudon and on Watts Bar, that grass starts to grow, starts to saturate the water with a bunch of oxygen, creates a hiding spot, creates an ambush point. Not only for the little dudes, but for the big dudes as well. And so first you'll see the bait, and then you'll see the predatory fish in the bass. And they start to move up there and, you know, flipping jigs on those grass lines and doing that kind of stuff, which we'll get into some of that more technique, okay. you know, like hyper technique specific stuff here in a minute, um, is just a great way to go and find those fish. So these main stand Tennessee River reservoirs south, lots of bar, yeah. loud and and chick, yeah. Hunter's Rule, you know, the whole system down the sky, anywhere it's got grass. Yeah. Look for the grass. That grass is probably the most important aspect to catching big fish this time of year and having consistency. And, you know, there's a bunch of different kinds of grass, and there's a bunch of different scenarios in which to fish that grass. Um, really, like, what I like to look for this time of year in grass itself is either isolated patches um, or a grass line, something that I can work my way down. Because, like, when you get into the big, expansive grass flats, you know, you say you got an ADHD. I do, too. Too many targets to cast out. I mean, it's too much. I mean, it's so... Yeah. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming. And a lot of people, that's when they think grass fishing, they think these giant expanses of grass. And it can be true, but the patience that you have to have there and just the ability to know the little nuances can overwhelm anglers that have never done it. And so with me, I'm always the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. I mean, that's what I like to do. And so instead of trying to break down this massive grass flat, what I like to do is find the isolated patches. Um, and the reason I do that is because I always, you know, kind of akin them to or a, a oasis in the middle of the desert. Like if you find a patch of grass that's as big as your boat in a massive mud flat, everything is going to be right there because it's going to allow oxygen in the water. You've got that, that saturated oxygen coming off that grass. It creates shade. It creates an ambush point. It creates a food source not only for the little dudes but for the big guys as well. And so this time of year, finding those kind of isolated areas where you can just go flip a jig or flip a creature bait or run a chatterbait bite or spinner bait or something like that, get those bass to react to something, is going to be one of your best bets for consistently catching fish, especially on a grass line. And then on the other side of that's a grass line. Um, and the grass lines are just, you know, again, expansive and massive, but you have something that you can look at. Like it's, oh, there's the line of grass. I can flip to that line of grass. And those bass just hang out on those grass lines and chill because one thing about the grass this time of year is that it's not topped out. Um, we don't got the cheese mats. And a lot of people, when they think grass fishing, they think frog fishing, which is true. And they think the cheese mats, you know, where it's got the, the cheese on top, the fungus that grows on top. And you're standing there and you're throwing a frog over it or you're punching it with a big weight. Um, but this time of year, that hasn't really happened yet. Um, and so when it's not cheesed out and when it doesn't have that cheese on top, there's not the canopy underneath for those bass to live under. And so there's no reason to try to get into the grass as much this time of year. I want to focus on the outside edges. And like the, anywhere there's a dip in the grass or a point out in the grass, that's where those bass are going to be. They're just going to live right on the inside edge so that they can rush out, grab something, and go back in. So are you fishing these like parallel, casting parallel with this grass line? Or are you going know, like It depends. So if I'm fishing something moving, I'll be parallel on it, just like I parallel bank, like 45 degree, just throw it in there and you'll buzz a bladed jig or even a buzz bait in the morning. I'm not a big buzz bait guy, but buzz baits in the morning, whopper ploppers, you know, fishing a frog down the edge of it. But then as the sun comes up and those bass kind of start to want to suck back up into that stuff and start to use that grass a lot more, I'll just get out and flip straight into it. You know, put the boat, you know, a flip and a half off the grass and just flip in there, let it drop, and it's real quick. I mean, like, one thing I think is huge this time of year that a lot of people don't focus on is making bass react to things. Um, and, and getting those bass to react is, is huge because you've got a bass that this time of year a lot of the times they've got everything that they need. They got all the food they need, they got all the oxygen. And so really, we're more 
tricking them to eat than we are like fooling them. You know what I mean? Like when you're dragging something or like dragging a drop shot, like you're trying to make that bass go, oh, that's something that looks like food that I should be able to eat. Where this time of year, man, they'll sit there locked on and look like they don't need anything. They'll feed it not, they don't need it because they're just like us. When it gets hot outside, they don't want to do nothing. They want to just sit and hang out. You know what I mean? And so by dropping like a jig or a flipping bait or something by their face really quick, it gets them to hit that instinct instinct to kill and that instinctual drive to react to something. Because a bass, the kind of brain that it has is, is fascinating. There are literally instances with a bass that when they see something, their brain makes them react in a way that they literally can't stop themselves from trying to eat. And so, like, very impulsive. Very impulsive. Yeah, I mean, like, it is rather exactly. It's so predatory. I mean, like, the goal of a predator. I mean, they they have that lizard brain predatory drive to kill. And so, when you drop a big jig past their face and it drops the bottom real quick, it's just and they just grab it. And that's a lot of time this time of year when people are flipping and they're grass fishing. You know, you flip in and never feel the bottom. You just flip in and it's never hits the bottom. You pick up and he's swimming sideways in it. And that's because when it dropped by his face, he just grabbed it, he's got it, and he's just sitting there. And that's the way they eat this thing. Yeah, reaction strike. React. You got to get them to react. And a lot of people think jerk bait, crank bait, chatter bait, which is true. But you can get them to react by dropping plastics by their face. Give us an example. Just bring your lures yeah. that yeah. you would flip right now. Yeah, absolutely. Show people. So, my number one is going to be a jig. Um, I love flipping a jig because it looks like a bluegill. You know, I mean, obviously bass are eating anything they can get their mouths on this time of year, and they're you know very opportunistic. But your bluegill is going to be what these bass focus on because it's what's going to be in the grass and be most readily available and able for them to see. And so, I love flipping a jig. This is a half ounce. Um, it's a Beast Coast tungsten jig, but I like the tungsten jig. I, I like the flipping jig too. So, what's cool about this jig is you can hold it up there. It's a weight forward jig. And so, by being weight forward, all the weight of the jig is in the head, like it's all centered forward. Okay. And so, it's going to make it drop a lot quicker than like your standard, like a dragon jig or even like a normal Arky style jig. And that's what you want. You want it to drop fast, and you want it to go by the face fast. And then also, the way that this line tie is set up, it's real recessed, so it is, allows it to get in and out of the grass a lot better. And then I pair that up like on the back with a chigger crawl or some other style of flap and crawl. Um, and really kind of my theory behind that, you know, is I like the claws that like oscillate or flap, like your rage crawl or your chigger crawl, something that flaps when it goes to the water. Because warm water and warming water, I want movement. Cold water and cooling water, I don't want movement. And this time of year, I want that movement. And so when you pair something up like a half ounce, it's really the perfect size. With that flapping trailer, it's going to do a really good job of looking like a bluegill and doing all the things that it needs to do for a bass to want to eat it. And so that's one of my favorite tools for flipping grass on this time. What color is that? That is, I believe that one's called dark crawl. So dark it's like crawl. Yeah, and, and you know, and I actually did a video about jigs. Um, kind of my theory behind jigs is I want a green pumpkin base, and I want a black and blue base. There's so many variables off those two things, right? Like dark crawl, you look at that and you're like. Oh yeah, it's got this, it's got that, but at its base, it's a green pumpkin. Right. With a little bit of brown and, uh, you know, some other stuff in there. And then on my trailer, I just want my trailer to do a really good job of contrasting my jig. Because one thing I do know and I've noticed about bass over years of fishing is they love contrast. Something that contrasts the water, something that contrasts the bottom, and something that contrasts itself. Because if you look at a bass, it's a lot of contrast. You look at a bluegill, it's a lot of contrast. I mean, it's a very, you know, deep little animal, meaning like you look at it and there's pinks and there's purples and there's blues and there's you turn it one way and it shimmers you turn it another way it shimmers and so with my jigs or really anything that i'm fishing that's what i look for is that contrast because contrast allows the bass to be able to see it really good and then too it looks like something they should eat you know you want to make it used to eating. yep used to eating and that's the thing is kind of hitting those uh you know a bass again simple really is if it's been rewarded with a meal by something that looks like that, it's going to eat that thing as many times as it can until it's out of eat. You know so what I mean? Like we like to eat certain things. Yes. And we're going to go to the restaurant and get that because we know it's yes. good. So yes. The bass the same way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, and even us, man, we'll see something. You'll think, oh, that tastes a certain way, and you put it in your mouth, and it doesn't taste that way, and you're like, whoa, bass, man. It's that. It's like it's instinct, dude. That's like yeah. some real primeval kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It's, it, it looks good, and then it turns out it's not good. We ain't never going to touch that again. It's not good. Yeah. All right, so uh, I don't know if you're ready to transition off grass. Let's do it, man. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
All right, so uh, Wes Jones says, what about the Elwise shad on Cherokee that seem to stay deep? Uh, does that affect the large mouth and cause them to stay deep? It can. It can. Um, what I've noticed is this time of year, a lot of those bait fish, and it was funny, I was driving here and I was watching some rockfish blow up on some bait in the back of the pocket. What you'll have is you'll have those bait fish transition up and down. And right now we're kind of in a weird spot because we've had this hurricane come through. So you got lakes that are being jacked up, you got lakes that are being jerked down. And so really kind of what we notice this time of year, and especially in that specific situation, and you look at places like Cherokee or Norris or Parksville, and Parksville's got a bunch of blueback herring in it. When that water gets jerked down this time of year because they're getting ready for that winter drawdown, they're getting ready for those winter rains, those bait fish will follow that water down, but then they'll kind of transition up and down throughout the day. So as the evening comes, they'll transition up and they'll get shallow. As the morning starts to dawn, you know, they'll stay shallow for a period, and then as the sun gets up, they start to transition back down deep. And so you've got a lot of, you know, and this is something I've noticed on our lake specifically, a lot of pelagic fish, for lack of a better term, meaning they live out there now. Like the water. Open water fish. And that's why these dudes that have pan optics and all these new forward-facing sonars are doing so well, because I truly believe that, like in this guy's situation, they're hitting a specific segment of the fish population that has never seen a lure before because all they do is chase those bait fish around and the more spots we get you know you got the coosa river spots and all that getting in here and the more smallmouth we get that's the kind of environment they want to live in they want to be out there chasing something whereas the large mouth you know they want to be in that deep water they can have their back on the water they do but like the smallmouth and the spots and stuff like that they'll, they'll chase those bait fish around so really one of the best ways to target that man is like you know Jerk bait, big topwaters drawing them up um, because I've drawn out, you know, spots and smallmouth like 25 foot of water, especially on the real clear lakes like North. And you can get on a point, throw a big topwater, big whopper plopper, something to draw those fish up, and they will come out of that water to come up and eat that because they're looking up. They've been chasing bait fish all day for weeks and months at a time, and so when that big bait comes over their head, it's a big opportunity for them to get a big meal, and they will expend a lot of energy to come get it. So yeah. the water's probably going to be pretty clear for them yeah. to see that. Right? Yeah. Cool. yeah, absolutely. So you're talking lakes like Cherokee, Norris, Mountain Hill, um, on the occasion when it's you know clear, um, Parksville, Chihaui, those kinds of places. The place you're going to be able to draw those big fish out. Another tool that I love to use, and unfortunately I didn't bring any with me tonight because they're always a fan favorite, is my big swim baits. So like my 6 to 12 inch swim baits. Depth's 250, S-Waver 200, um, big you know, 2, 3, 4 ounce swim baits. And the drawing power and the drawing potential of those baits, especially on those clear bodies of water like that, is just amazing. Um, and man, I've seen fish, I've seen spots swim 50 foot down a bank to come look at that swim bait and to try to eat it. And so that's another kind of tool that you can consider. Like if you know, if you want to start playing around with it, something like an S Waiver 200 um, size swim bait, you can throw it on like a you know, seven six heavy flipping stick and get away with it and just toss that thing around and play around with it, man. And it's amazing what it'll do to those fish. They will come out of the wood jar to look for it. Now you can do that. Oh, dude, it is. And you can do that on chick. You can do that on walk. I mean, any lake, man, you can take those big swim baits and get on a really, really unique and cool bite. And you're not going to catch a bunch. The ones you catch are going to be giants, but you're going to see a lot and you're going to learn a lot about fish. And that's one of my favorite things to do is just take a big swim bait and go learn about the fish. What color right? swim bait? Am I ever doing it on basic water conditions? Man, I, you know, it's funny you ask that because, like, one of my favorite colors to throw is called light trout. And I will take that light trout and I'll throw it on anybody water in East Tennessee. I'll throw it on anybody water in the country. It looks like a trout, but I really believe when you start throwing baits that are that big, you know, 12 inches long, that most of the time when a bass sees that in nature, it's not fake. And so the size alone, regardless of the color, is going to draw that bass out to come investigate and see what that is. Because you've got this 12-inch piece of meat in their head that's just kind of whoop, just lumbering along, and they're like, hey, that thing's dying. I could probably kill it. And so they come out there like a cheetah or a lion, and they're like, well, we're going to try to kill it. You know what it's I mean? worth my energy. Exactly. So color, man, on those, it just, I, I've always thrown something like that light trout or just something sort of semi-natural, but still you will a little bit of flash in there, something that's going to kind of just throw a little bit of flash, and it just draws those big ones up. That's a really cool, that's just, in my opinion, if you want to have a ton of fun, that's really a really good way to do it.
So, keep, keep the questions coming, because if not, we're just going to keep rolling with whatever uh, Alex wants to talk about. But yeah. your YouTube channel, before I forget yeah. that, at Alex Rub Fishing. Yep, Alex Rub Fishing for everything. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Um, also, any podcast um, player, I'll be on there as well. It's Alex Rub Fishing for everything. And so you can go check it out. And, uh, yeah, it's really cool, man. Never thought it would be what it is, but here we are talking and doing this, and it's really, really fun. I do uh, a lot of educational stuff, so I'm an educator. I'm an elementary school teacher, and so obviously my heart lies in education, but I also have a tremendous you know, passion for bass fishing. I've been bass fishing since before I even knew what bass fishing was. My dad was taking me fishing. Um, my, literally, my earliest memory is catching a smallmouth bass on Mountain Hill Lake on a Bandit 200. That's like literally my earliest memory. And so I've been bass fishing. I'm 27 now. I've been bass fishing my whole entire life. And uh, yeah, I just started a YouTube channel, not knowing what it would be. Like I started it for fun, and I just wanted to like share my experiences and uh, teach people some stuff that I know about bass fishing. Because you know my experience is going to be different than your experience. It's going to be different than Bethany's experience. It's going to be different than Kevin Van Dam's experience. You know, I mean, from the highest level to the to the brand new angler, we're all on this ladder. And so I just want to share my experience of where I'm at and what I know to hopefully help guys like are tuning in tonight, which thank you guys for taking time out of your busy day, your busy week to come hang out with us. I know we all work full-time jobs here, so for you to take time out, I really do appreciate it. But I just want to help these guys out and, and teach them a little something. So. All right, here's some good questions right here. Uh, ready, ready I'm ready, this? dude. I'm going to go to this one first, uh, Nathan. I'll come right back to you about catching deep, deep bass on the north. But... Uh, Gigi says, what do you have against buzz baits? Oh, man. So I actually did a video about this. I did uh, the baits that I hate. Um, I don't really hate them, but I don't catch fish on them. Um, don't have a ton of success on a buzz bait, which is really weird to me because my fishing personality is to fish in water that deep and to power fish. And I just, just a buzz bait is something that I've never thrown a whole lot. Like when the whopper plopper came out, I figured the whopper plopper out and I never looked back. And so, I don't know what Whopper is, man. so Whopper Whopper is. Show me or tell us what that yeah, is. I don't got one with me. Um, they're like a. I don't even know how to. So imagine a crankbait, right? It's about that long, slender body, kind of looks like a walking topwater, right? But on the back there is a a cup, and it turns, and it plops. And the name Whopper Popper comes from the sound it makes. And so it was originally designed to catch these like giant Amazon fish. I forgot what like a wolf fish in the Amazon. This guy named Larry Dalberg designed it. And so the first one he came out with was like you know, 16 inches long, and he'd take it to the Amazon catch this thing. And then people started experimenting with muskies, and then they started catching giant smallmouth and muskie sizes. And then so they were like, oh, so let's downsize this thing a little bit and see what happens. And so they downsized them, and now they've got sizes from that big to that big. And they work. Yeah, dude, it just bubble, 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 just like a button. It literally is a, it's a buzz bait that floats and has trouble. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Whopper. Google it. Pick some up. Yeah, no kidding. No Sounds kidding. like fun. Yeah. All right, so uh, great great question, great answer. All right, so let's go for uh, any tips for catching deep bass and norris. Deep bass and norris. Man, this time of year, you're going to have to slow way, way down. A um, lot of pressure on norris. We all know it's a recreational lake. When you drive over norris at any one moment, we come over 33 on the way here, and it was four boats driving under 33 bridge, you know. So that boating pressure alone, not just fishing pressure, but boating pressure is going to keep those fish deep. And two, Norris is just a lake where fish live deep. You know, a segment of the population of fish just live in 25 foot of water their entire life. So this time of year, man, you know, throwing like a little bitty four to five inch swim bait on a ball head, the Ned rig, which I actually brought one with me because you look at it. The Ned rig is going to be a great tool. Um, you know, dragging that Carolina rig, you know, deep cranking sort of i know some guys that do it but it's not something that i think is like a you can repeat a whole lot it's got to be kind of a special bot but like for repeatable bots that you can go consistently catch fish dragging stuff like shaky heads and then rigs you know something real subtle do nothing kind of plastics you know everybody's seen the ned rig everybody loves the ned rig but just dragging something like that little ned rig around is going to be huge and just really really taking your time breaking down the big long tapering points anything with gravel on it anything with mud i mean norris is a it's a unique lake and ever since the zebra mussels got in it it got even more unique it's i mean clear. yeah man and i mean i was already clear when i was a kid i went hunting the chuck swan but you may i walked over to norris lake and i'm like that's how clear that water is because i grew up on douglas so yeah. it's really green and, yeah and i had no idea why but it's even clear exactly and so that fact too has pushed those fish even deeper 
and so they just a lot of them live deep this time of year especially and so dragging something small dragging something subtle really taking your time to work those areas down is going to be huge and with norris this is something i actually learned on one of the podcasts i did with, with john um fisher's biologist he was talking about on how on norris that there's just certain areas of the lake that has fish and there's certain areas that just don't and you know through their shocking surveys they've seen areas that are just unproductive and they've seen productive areas so that being said if you get a bite stay in that area like norris is one of the few lakes around here that you can milk an area for two three four hours at a time and only get two or three bites out of that area but they're all going to be good fish and that's something i've definitely noticed this time of year is just slow down i mean slow to the point where you drag it and just let it sit i mean it's the most boring type of fishing but if you want to catch them on the horse that's the stuff you got to do or go night fishing because then when you go night fishing you can power fish you not fish much i don't as much as i used to obviously filming you know i, I want to film videos and uh actually working on getting a night vision camera we're trying to get that worked out now yeah it's gonna be cool if we can get it um but i don't as much as i used to man but night fishing is one of the best ways to catch them on a lot of these lakes this time of year and really if it was going to be like, if someone said, Alex, how do I catch the most fish that I can and have the chance to catch big ones this time of year, show up at the lake about 10 o'clock at night and fish till about 3 o'clock in the morning. And I mean, it's just the way it is. You know, big spinnerbait, big Colorado spinnerbait, black, big black and blue jig. So at night, dark colors. Dark colors, because you want to contrast. Yeah. You want to, add, so a bass, its eyes has rods and cones, just like ours do. Um, I don't know which one does what, but one perceives color, one perceives shape. And so, like, you're standing in front of me, my rods, I think, are showing you the colors that I see, and then my cones are showing me your outline. And so, when the bass's eyes at night, they go primarily to what they can see as far as the profile. They start looking for shapes. And so, bigger, bulkier items, and, you know, long, bigger worms, bigger jigs, things that make a lot of noise are going to hit the lateral line and then if they can pick it up on that lateral line and then pinpoint it with their eyes they're going to want to eat it so big dark things that are going to create a profile so just, just to simplify it yeah. night fishing that's that's what you would yep yeah and in, right now too with the muddy water man we're about to yeah, rain. yeah and that's what i, I kind of want to talk about that because i was driving here in cherokee is it's clay pit you know what i mean there's just so much mud that, that dumps into it same thing in the muddy water you can literally take your night fishing baits and go fish the muddy water and catch fish because the muddy rising water is going to put those fish on the bank and so you're going to be able to almost repeat the night time by um, in during the day because the water's going to be really muddy yeah that's good too. yeah so that muddy water muddy rising water bass will follow the water up especially a large mouth a large mouth loves to live shallow and it's just part of that kind of instinctual drive to protect themselves is they follow that water up and then they find something to get on whether it's wood whether it's man-made some kind of hard structure they put their back right up next to it and so flipping big jigs throwing big spinnerbaits around that stuff is a great way when the water's super muddy to get a bite because that'll be another issue i mean it's like another channel we live in a very unique place in the fact that we get a ton of rain and the water muddies up we got clear lakes, we got deep lakes, we got shallow lakes, we got rivers, and so, and then we've got a ton of pressure. And so, just kind of being willing to experiment and go and fish times that other people don't fish and those kind of things can really help you catch a ton of fish. Good stuff. All right, got another question here, if you don't mind answering. Uh, Elliot G is saying, is there a minimum water clarity for throwing the glide bait? I just started this year and have had a blast. <laughs> Dude, uh, so yeah, sort of and sort of not. I mean, obviously, you don't want to throw it in chocolate milk. They got to be able to see it. Um, but I have thrown the glide bait in three or four foot visibility water, and I've thrown it in 20 foot visibility water. And both times I've had followers. I think the biggest thing as far as clarity is more for you as the angler rather than the fish. The fish is going to know it's there. Bass being the ultimate predator in its environment, as soon as that thing touches the water, that lighter line picks it up. And as big as that thing is, like, it is hitting every sense to go check that thing out that that bass has. You know what I mean? Because you've got a 12-inch bait that's going in the water, and those bass are like, oh, my God, i got to try to eat that right. Um, but for you, as the angler, I think it's going to be more important because when you see the follower and you see that bass actually follow out behind that bait, it's going to help you determine a couple things. Is he going to be able to eat this thing, or is he willing to eat this thing, and then what do I need to do to get him to eat it? Um, because with the glide bait, 
you know, you'll be gliding this thing out through here. The people have never seen a glide bait. Imagine literally a 12 inch. Pretty much split right down the middle. And you got your tail out the back, head out the front. And when you reel your reel and you take out the slack and the line, just like a walking bait, it's going to dart out from one side. And then when you hit it again, it's going to dart back the other direction. And so what will happen is the bass will come up and start following that thing. And there's really three or four different types of follows that I've experienced. Number one is the lazy follow. The lazy follow is where they're way back off of it. They don't really see, they're interested in what it is, but they're not hyper aggressive toward it. The next one's going to be what I call the top follow. And that's where he's right on the back of it. Like is when you hit it, he's following it right up. And they follow it, they follow it. Those fish you can get to eat. It'd be a little bit tougher to get them to eat it, but those fish you can get to eat. Let's say he's following it, but he won't commit to it. What do you do? I love to hit it hard and get it dark fast because you've got to get the bass to react to it. Um, because if he's following it like that, for the most part, something in his brain is telling him it's not right. It's like it's not safe. You know, not actually not rationalizing that. They're not going, hey, Bob, look at that big old fish. Better not eat it. It's just like their brain is like, that's not safe enough for me to try to kill it. Like, it, I like it, but it kind of freaks me out at the same time. And so what I'll do is, if I see him following it, I'll just hit it hard. Like, tick, 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 get it to go, tick, 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 like it's scared, I gotta get away. Like, exactly, exactly. And when it tick, 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 away from him, that bass, a lot of the times it'll just hit that instinct and they'll just rush up and grab it because they're like, I can't let this thing get away from me. And so that's what I like to do there. And then like the third and fourth time type, type of follow, obviously the fourth one's gonna be it's no follow at all, they just blast it. I mean, there's fish, that's what you want. That's what you want. I mean, those are the ones you don't even see. They come out of nowhere, like a muskie or something. You know, muskies will do it, the bass will do it. I mean, just out of nowhere and just keep on it. But the, the third kind of follow is like the hyper-aggressive follow. And, and those are honestly one of the toughest ones to catch because spots and small enough do it the most. And it's where they're just like smacking. Like those tap, 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 and kill it. Try to kill it, try to hit it, and like, you can stop it, you can speed it up, and you can do a lot of things to it, but a bass has a unique ability to hit a treble hook and not get to, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And those type of fish, man, a lot of the times, it's more about making repetitive casts. So if you have one come out on a cot and they tap, 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 and they miss it completely, reel up, get back in there, and just start working that thing back out again, because hopefully the next time it screws up and it catches one of those trebles and when you can hook. So yeah, a lot of times with the glide baits, I mean, you have bass that try to eat them, but a lot of the times, man, you're just you're getting lucky and you're sticking a treble hook in their face because there's no way they're actually going to get the whole bait in their mouth unless it's like a ten or twelve pounder. Um, and so, really, you know, they'll come up and they'll try to eat it. And if you get lucky and they try to eat one of them trebles and you get a mouthful of treble, then you've got to get fish in it. You know what I mean? So muskies are the same way, man. Like people talk about musky fish a lot of that. Oh, dude, they're we have we'll have to do that. That's stupid That's amount of fun. Drop the tailgate Yeah, dude, man. You would talk about like a stupid amount of fun. Those things are stupid amount of fun. But yeah, the the glide bait is. I, if you've not done it, guys, just go try it. Like I can't explain to you the magic. How's it different than a swim bait? So a glide bait is essentially a hard body swim bait. It's just like with your swim bait, you got the big tail. You know, you got this tail that oscillates out in the back, or you know, you got the head shimmy. It's more just like you're a steady retreat. You know what I mean? Where the glide bait is, it's funny, and it's been referred to by many of my buddies that kind of taught me how to glide bait fish, is the biggest finesse bait that you'll ever throw. And it, there is a lot of finesse to it. I mean, there's, you know, making it glide right, you know, bringing it around the front of an object. Because one of the things that, another tip I'll give you about glide baits is since we're on them, imagine this is a tree limb. You don't want to bring it past the tree limb out here. You want to bring it right next to the tree limb because that's when you're going to have the best chance for that bass to not come out and follow it, but to just blast it and try to kill it. And so, you know, bringing that thing in there on a tight glide, letting it hang, and then right back out again. And those are the kinds of things that get you, get the big ones in there. You know what I mean? And it's just, I mean, just crazy, man. I've had wolf packs of six and seven pounders falling off the bank before I check them off. And I mean, I've, yeah. I've, you fire, oh, dude, yeah. I mean, biggest... The biggest fish of my life I lost until I caught one bigger than him later on, but it was 10, 12 pound fish on Chickamauga. I mean, giant, it was teener size, come on the glide bait. And she come off a limb, we brought it right by a limb, and she come off that limb and just stoked it. And unfortunately, as big as she was and as much torque as she had on me, and torque I had on her, had some stuff break apart. And that's what I learned about good snap, you know, good snap rings and good treble hooks and really, you know, 
focus and all that kind of stuff for those big fish, especially when you're on chick, man. Chick is, that's the freak factor. You got to be ready for those things. Freak factor. That's right. I like that. Yeah. That's where the state record. Yeah, 15 pounds, man. Years yeah. back. Do you know him by chance? He's teacher, you? I don't. I, I, I knew his, I used to mow his father-in-law's yard. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty funny. I did. I don't know him, though. I never got to meet him. But, yeah, he. Uh, I heard about that and heard he's, we got out for snow one day. And he uh, drove down to Chick. Yep, drove down to Chick and went and caught the state record, man. And I went down there this year, broke my PB, caught a ten and a half pounder, had a forty pound day. It was on live bait. Uh, we were just having some fun catching on live bait. And man, just it it uh it showed me what was actually in that thing. Cause I caught I caught a thirty pound bag there on artificials a couple times and um, five, five fish. Yeah, five fish yeah. for thirty. Yeah, and it was just insane days, man. You know and. But when I went down there and did the live bait fishing, dude, it showed me just that place is, it's chalk, it's full. It's like going deer hunting in Fort Campbell, knowing that those owners are yeah. there. You, know, yeah. you may not get one, but yeah. the opportunity, exactly. man, it's nothing like exactly. hunting big deer and knowing that they're there. I'm sure it's the same way. It is, man. Fishing for big fish, knowing that they're there. It is, dude, and especially on chick. I mean, every time you go to chick, any swing can be a tip. Any swing, it can be a 10 pounder. Or, you know, when you're river fishing, any swing can be an 8 pound small. I mean, I've heard of them being caught. You know, so, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. All right, I'm going to get back to these questions. You're good, man. Um, so, let's see. You said your favorite way to fish is at a few inches of water. Yes, what sir. are you looking for in those shallow areas? Boom Street is asking that question. So, it's going to depend. Um, this time of year, and, and we're going to kind of get into some sneaky, sneaky stuff here, and this is not stuff that I talk about often, but we're going to talk about it. I do a lot of river fishing. I look for moving water. I go way up in the river on Cherokee. I go way up in the river on Mountain Hill. I go way up in the rivers in Norris. You know, go up in the Powell, go up in the Clinch. Um, go find moving creeks. You know, Norris is a great place to go flip this time of year if you can find groundwater coming in. There's a lot of ground. I mean, right yeah, and there should. I mean, with all the rain and stuff we've had, right now is going to be a great opportunity to go get in that deep of water to flip. Um, so what I look for, literally the main thing I look for is moving water. I want the water to be moving, whether that be a river, a creek, groundwater, something. I want moving water because that moving water is going to be oxygenated. It's going to make those bass get on things. It's going to make the bait fish get on stuff. So like when the water is moving, obviously the bass isn't just going to be out in the middle of it like a trout swimming. He's going to want to tuck up next to things and the bait fish are going to do the same thing. And so, you know, flipping wood, flipping lay downs, flipping man-made stuff in that current is going to be huge. And then obviously we got so many dams around here. You know, we've got a lot of dam discharges, floating rivers and stuff to the kayak. Um, if you have the ability to have an aluminum boat that can run up into some of that stuff, getting into that stuff, fli uh, flipping and fishing those dam discharges, man, this time of year can be huge. And one of my favorite things to do is just go get below, like, Watts Bar Dam. Go get below Chickamauga Dam and just go flipping, go throwing a big swim bait and doing that kind of stuff in that current. And that current fishing this time of year is just going to be... I tell people, you know, a current current in rivers attract the biggest predators in the lake. Giant strappers, caught in the rivers. They're caught below dams. Giant muskie, they're caught in the rivers. They're caught below dams. Your giant carp, your giant, you know, bullheads, your giant everything, they live below those dams. Your bass, big walleyes, bass are no different. They're a predatory fish just like they are. So some of your biggest, baddest fish are going to be below those dams. And people that watch my channel, they'll know I'm a, I'm a river fishing fiend, man. I run an aluminum boat, and uh, I just, you know, I take that thing places that other people won't. Be safe. I know a guy who messaged me and tore his boat up trying to run up into some of the stuff I run up into. So take your time. Be safe. Wear your life jacket. You know, don't be stupid. But all at the same time, you know, find that moving water. Moving water is the biggest thing that I look for. You run a jet drive? I do not. I'm fortunate. I do want one though. I'm going to have to convince Bethany wherever she goes. <laughs> she just stepped away. Yeah, yeah. See, she stepped away at the right time. I do want to run a jet drive, but uh, no, I'm just running an aluminum prop, but I uh, aluminum boat with a prop on it. But uh, I got a jack plate, so I can jack that motor up and draw it. Yep. Yep. So four or five inches, six inches up. And, you know, I've really kind of figured out my boat and how my boat runs, and then I'm able to run it up in some pretty shallow stuff. And I've also spent a ton, a ton of time out of it. Like, that's one thing, just for your guys' safety, and because I want you guys to be safe, don't just go blasting up into some river you've never been up into. Um, I can't tell you how many hours and hours and hours that I've spent idling in places to figure out where the deep spots are at, where the stuff's at. And the rivers are ever-changing. They're always shifting. 
and you'll have a log here one day and then the next day it'll be 20 feet down the river. And so just taking your time and idling through spots and marking stuff and knowing where stuff at is at is huge because then once you've got all that work done, then you can run up in there and actually go do the fishing and, and you know, be a little bit more quick and you know, power fish and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's see if we got any more, uh, any more questions. No, not yet. If y'all have more questions for uh, Alex, you know, send them in here. But so let's let's say right now Alex Rudd's going on fishing. So your favorite body of water, be it a river, lake, or fish in East Tennessee right now. You just want to go out and go catch fish this evening. It's six forty-five here in East Tennessee. Where are you going? Man, that's a good question. That's a good question. Right now, I would probably go to like a Loudon, um, like a Little River area. I'd lock a jig in my hand. I'd go for it. And when so right, summer jig, what you showed me. Right yep, there? yep, jig, and or some kind of creature bait. And I brought some stuff with me, as far as like creature baits and stuff. Um, you know, flipping, flipping your creature baits and like the cross style baits. One of my favorites. Of this is a Max Scent Creature Hog. But just kind you know of. Oh yeah, man, that's it'll hit you. But like something like your creature hog, just those real flat, do nothing appendages. It's going to drop really fast. Obviously, got that max scent on there. Um, and you know what's crazy about this is it's kind of a sponsor plug because I do work with Berkeley. But the max scent, it works. I don't know what it is. It, I was never a believer in it. And when that stuff came along, man, it like changed it. And I think really for like our pressure bodies of water and as much stuff as our fish see, having just one more little thing that's gonna hit that fish's instinct and it tastes right, and smells right, could be huge. But something, flipping something like that, you know, three eighths, half ounce weight, pegging it and uh, flipping it around boat docks, around lay downs. And that's another thing this time of year, you know, you kind of, you'll figure out where they're at. You know, they'll be in the grass, they'll be on the wood, they'll be on the man-made stuff, they'll be on the natural stuff. And it's just kind of a function of like, right now I have no idea what's going on. So I would go to an area like Little River, you know, Little River area, and I would just get on a bank and I'd just start going. And every bite that I got would be a clue as to the puzzle of what I'm looking for. So when I catch a fish, it's not just, I think one thing a lot of people do is a huge mistake is they go, oh, I got one. And they get really caught up with the fish catch, which is awesome. I want people to do that. But like, get caught up with the fish catch, but also make a mental note. Oh, he was on that tree. Or he was on the backside of that boat dock. Or, oh, there's a clump of grass right there. Because that's just another piece of the puzzle. And then if you go down the bank and you hit another boat dock and you get another bite, you go, oh, that's another boat dock. So it could be vertical coming. And then you get a bite on another boat doctor. Then you've got three pieces of it. You know, three pattern bites. Three bites is a pattern to me. And if okay. I got three bites, then I'm going to go run that pattern until it proves to me that it's not the pattern. It's changed. Mm-hmm. You've got to try something else. Exactly. Exactly. So like right now, man, I'd be I'd be flipping up shallow because this time of year we talk about transitions in the beginning. Fish will transition throughout the day too. They'll be in, you know 10, 15 foot of water suspended when the sun's up or be tucked back into something as far as they can get back into it while the sun's up. And as the sun starts to get down, we start to get into this time of the day where the sun isn't beaming down on them, they'll start to move back out, they'll start to use those different pieces of cover and structure and things like that, and they'll start to feed on the bait fish because the bait fish do the same exact thing. The bait fish, the bluegill, they start to move out, so the bass just follow the hamburger, man. They follow the hamburger. <laughs> nice. All right, let's see. Uh, here's a good one from Nathan Pelosi. He says, what's your go-to for live bait? Live bait. So I've only done it a few times. Um, the one time that I did it was with Gizzard Chad, Cast Nate and Gizzard Chad. Um, my buddy, Mr. Caleb Bell, is an awesome dude. He lives down on Chickamauga. He's like the cast net wizard. Like, I tried it, and I looked like a baby draft. had just been born. You know, I was out there swinging around. <laughs> but uh, Gizzard Chad, and then we also use these things called salties. Um, we use those in the river, like in moving water a lot. They're real, real hardy. And uh, there's a few shops around here that sell them. But I'm saying it looks like a little tart. A really weird looking little fish. I mean, you can like bang their head off the side of a, you know, a big old pylon and they don't kill it. And you just let them things swim around down there and it'll tighten up and there's no telling. It could be a four pound smallmouth or a gar or a catfish. I mean, it's, that's that's a ton of fun. You ever used a uh, live ale wine? I'm not. Fish. I'm not. I fished with a, a guy below um, Blue Dam on Fort Patrick Henry, and he took me hybrid uh, striped bass fish. Yeah. Down there. We used live hell wide. The simplest rig, man, like a number 10 travel hook, yeah. a leader about yay long, and put those things through the nostrils yeah. right there and just, just let them drink with the current, man. You talk about fun, those little 10, 12 pound hybrids, too much. Power those things. That's, that's awesome. A, that's all I'm talking about. Beating fish like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's that makes it going. It's a lot of 
and O's yeah. and not call it crap like that. So yeah. they, they work and I understand why. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the real thing. You got yeah. that in one of those fish. I tell people place. all the time, speaking of hamburgers, if I set a plastic hamburger in front of you and a real hamburger, you're gonna eat the real hamburger. Yeah. And a bass has a unique ability to to really distinguish between the two. And I Chickamauga that day when we when I caught the forty pound bag and broke my PB. It proved it to, to me because I had two buddies in the boat with me, Caleb Bell and then another buddy of mine from upstate New York. He had jerked down. He was stopping by him to Texas. And he was fishing a jerk bait, and Caleb was fishing an artificial swim bait. And I'm standing in between them with a gizzard jack. And I caught probably, I don't know, 25 fish that day. Best five went 40 pounds. I caught two eight-pounders and a 10, all on live bait. And they never, I think they both got one bite a piece of them. And so, exactly, man. And I mean, like, it just proved to me how tough it is to catch a bass. And I think how much pride you really got to have in yourself when you fool one enough to eat, especially anything above that, like, three-pound class range, man. And a lot of people get caught up in this, I want to catch 20-pound bags, I want to catch five-pounders, I want to catch this, which is awesome. I do, too. Man, I love that. But, like, man, I think you take a lot of pride in tricking a three-pounder to eat because they just, I think... And John talked to me about this, the fisheries biologist. There is more bass living in one area than you could ever catch out of that mind area. Blowing. It's mind blowing. You see what's down there after yeah. uh, uh, electric fishing. Yeah. It will humble you. Exactly. <laughs> and so having pride in catching them, I, mean, I think is I think is huge. So yeah, it's wild, man. That's a that's just a very unique thing. Like that live bait fishing. That's it's fun. I do it just occasionally because it it ruin me. I don't want it to ruin. Oh yeah, you know what I mean? for sure. Um, so. I, I, I want to talk about Douglas because that's where I grew up. That's where yes, my sir. heart's at. And then I want to go to Upper East Tennessee, okay. like Boom, Fort Patrick Henry, Watauga, yeah. South Holston, yeah. that whole bunch of To me, that's like a whole different world. I didn't go up there growing up. Yeah. Like, we went to Big Town, we went to Knoxville. I didn't yeah. go to Tri City. You never did anything up there. So working with the AC, I realized there's a lot of water yeah. up there. So tell me about Douglas. Like if you're going to Douglas right now, where would you launch your boat and what kind of fish are you doing? So for me on Douglas right now, um, I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to run up in the river. I'm going to go up into the um, French Broad, up into the Nolichucky. Um, Nolichucky is dangerous, so don't jack around up there a whole lot if you don't know what you're doing. French Broad can be too. Um, but I'm going to go find that moving water, man. Throwing a spinner bait, flipping the jig, throwing a swim jig, throwing like a paddle tail swim bait, getting in that current, you know, going to those first shoals, like that first shoal that you can't get past. Go to that, sit there, and just start casting, man. And, Big small mouth and large mouth are going to live there. And then if I'm not doing that, that's when I'm kind of, kind of transition into this time of year. Um, I've spent a lot of time on Douglas. Douglas was a lake that I grew up fishing on. Was my dad's favorite lake still is to this day. You know, back of Muddy Creek is like I told I told Dad I was like, well, these days that's where I'm going to spread your ashes. Back of Muddy Creek. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Just looking at you know looking at the mountains. Yeah. Man. I, you know, we joke about that and stuff like that. But, like, for real, you know, it's, it's where I grew up fishing. I have a lot of memories there. Um, but for me this time of year, I'm going to start focusing shallow. I'm going to flip. Flip the buck bushes, flip the cypress tree, or not the set, whatever those, like, you know, the, the, willow, the willow trees and those the kind of things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in like, I almost punch it like people punch mats. I'll get big three-quarter ounce weights, 50-pound braids, seven-six heavy rod, and I'll go drop a bait right in the center of those trees. And I mean, I've, I've taken her and like we've gone and had 20 pound days like right now, this time of day, right now, going out and have a spook on the deck of the boat for when they start pushing bait behind you in the middle of the pocket and then just dropping a big weight and like that creature hog like we talked about a few minutes ago, right in the middle of them bushes, man, you catch some big ones down. Spook. Yeah. That's the old school there. Yeah, dude, throwing the spook, man. I love throwing the spook. My top water, period. I love top water. But yeah, dude, having a spook this time of year can be huge too. Um, that's probably one of my top five like transitional baits is a spook because just like I saw them striper down there you know blowing up that's what they do and we were talking about that earlier on Norris is bait fish move up and down and as the sun starts to go down they start to move up predatory fish follow them and you'll have a lot of schooling fish just out in the middle of the pockets and if you stay off of them make a good long cast and just walk that spook man you're going to catch something and hopefully you know for the bass guys it's going to be a four pound small mouth or a four pound large mouth but catching 30 pound rockfish wouldn't be bad either so <laughs> that's got some stress on that oh yeah dude right for sure all right let's see we got another question here boone street is asking if you were going to fish teleco or loudon where are you going to put it in 
Uh, loud and again, I mean, up in the river somewhere. I mean, I, dude, I'm telling every everybody when they ask me this question, I'm like, I'm going to a river. So like, you're talking about above Knoxville. Yes. Forks the river. Holston and the it's French Broad. Yep. Those are the places I love to go. I love to fish. Um, you know, I do a lot of stuff like even like riding downtown Knoxville, like right below the stadium. I mean, there's a lot of good fishing right there. You know what I mean? And I just my my fishing personality and what I love is moving water. And I have so, uh, so much confidence in moving water. And really, I used to be that guy that went out and got on ledges and 25 foot and deep things and drove the parallel over and drove yeah. the big jet. I used to do that. That's what my dad like raised me doing. And so I have a ton of experience doing that. But when I figured out that I could go exploit, for lack of a better term, this shallow water body and this moving water, is when my total perspective on summer fishing changed. Because dude, there's some of these rivers, especially when the dams are around the water, 68 degrees. And the main lake's 94. So you gotta, you, you tell me which where they want to be. They want to be in the 68. And then two, two, you have the potential of catching a giant small mouth all year long. Giant spots, bigger large mouth, because the river fish are just built differently. I mean, they have an immense amount of food. They live on a treadmill their whole time. So not only are they bigger, you know, bigger tails, just fatter fish, but they're also just like more powerful fun to catch, building things and other fish around these kind of years. You know, and it's one of those deals when I'm in a river, I can catch them on a walk plopper or a frog or something like that all day long. Whereas the people out in, you know, the main lake are out deep, deep cranking, so, which is a ton of fun. Caught a lot of big fish doing it. My PB was on a 6.6D, wherever my keys are at. All right, she's got her keys, but I got a 6.6D on my key ring that I keep with me all the time. And my PB came on on Douglas, deep crank. I caught two seven-pounders back-to-back before I caught my 10. And, uh, yeah, dude, it was a, cra- that was a crazy day. And um, that was all deep fishing. And it's just as I've grown up and... As I've kind of figured out my own fishing personality, it's river fishing. It's more river fishing. I love it. Everybody knows Ike Defoe. Yes. Household names, yep. Rush Beast, Tennesseans here. I talked to Ike before the Bass Master Classic of 2019. Yeah. Sitting in his boat when I had the big media day. I'm in uniform, man, and you know, kind of, you know, nerded out. Amen. Yeah. Big fan and all. And uh, I said, dude, if you. If you could fish anywhere right now, because there were limits on where they could go during the, the, the classic. So where would you fish? He said, I'd go right behind my house. And you know what? He lives on the, the Holston River, way the heck up there. He said, I'd take my boat right there behind my house, and that's where I would stay. Yep. He couldn't go that far because that was, that was off limits yep. for him. Dude ended up winning the whole freaking yeah. thing anyways, yeah. but that told me right then, there's a lot to this river fishing that, yeah. that a lot of people don't ever exploit for lack of, uh, they don't know any better, they don't know how to fish it, or they're just like you were raised fishing deep water in the summer. When I, when I want to do this uh, this show, that's what I figured we'd be talking about, deep water yeah, cranking yeah. and all that long line and crap, yeah. man, you know, it wears you out, yeah. they go plug, so it's really interesting to hear you say, get in the river, I like, I like the river fishing. So. Yeah, yeah, dude, and I mean, that's the thing, I mean, you look at a guy like I, I've been lucky enough to fish with him a couple of times, and I mean, he's just a, he's a river rat, dude. And it's, it's East Tennessee culture. I mean, like, there's a lot of guys that, they're the deep fishing guys, and then there's like this little subculture of the river dudes. And, you know, kayak fishing has allowed a lot of, like, people who don't have jet boats and have the specialized equipment to be able to fish those rivers. And, and that's something that I love, too, you know, floating that kayak, because I can take a kayak anywhere. You know what I mean? As, as long as I can roll it, you know what I mean, to get it somewhere, I'm able to put it in. But, dude, that river fishing, man, it's just, it's a hidden gem of East Tennessee. And really, all of Tennessee, and all of Alabama, northern Alabama, I mean, everywhere. There are rivers that feed all of these lakes, and all of those rivers have fish in them that, for the most part, are untouched. And they're just, it's, it's a ton of fun. It, it was awesome to me to see how many people, how many professionals moved to Tennessee from all over the country. They moved here because the fishing was so good. Mm-hmm. And that, man, that made me proud that mm-hmm. we have that great of fish yeah yeah i mean you got wheelers here now jacob wheeler i mean which he's the goat now dude i mean you know kevin van damme's always going to be the goat but jacob wheeler i mean just his the streak of winning that he's on his ability to catch fish is amazing he's living on chickamauga um you know obviously we got you know brandon lester and brandon coulter and hot and all the dudes who are from here um but then you got dudes like justin lucas who moved into alabama and they're real close to tennessee and i see him up here a lot i've seen him on watts bar i've seen him on chick fishing and uh, I mean, it, it, it's for a couple reasons. Number one, amazing fishers. We've done, a, you guys have done a good job, and we as anglers have done a good job of leading a fight on conservation like no other place in the country. You know what I mean? And like, that's something I advocate all the time, you know, on my channel is taking care of what we've got. But then number two, the diversity of fisheries makes us really good. 
I mean, like, I can go anywhere in the country and feel comfortable. You know, the only thing that I had really never experienced in my life was the day that I went out on Lake Michigan and stood in, on the front of the boat in 65 foot of water and saw the bottom. That was the only thing I had. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's the only thing I hadn't experienced in East Tennessee. Otherwise, man, I've seen tannic water. I've seen tea-colored water. I've seen chocolate milk. I've seen extremely clear water. I've seen the Green Douglas water. I've seen the Sapphire Creeks on Norris Lake. I mean, we get to experience so much stuff. And so it draws in these anglers because they know they need that diversity so that we can get it here in East Tennessee. Right, what a great flow. All yeah, right, man. Dude. Come on. All right, y'all keep the questions coming. Uh, I'm going to have you take us to Upper East Tennessee just because yes. I don't know a whole lot about fishing up there other than the trout fishing. It's spectacular mm -hmm. up there. Tell me about the bass fishing where you would go to Upper East Tennessee. So I have honestly limited experience myself. Um, I've been on South Holston a little bit. Um, there would be glide baits up there because of the trout. Um, and then my buddy came down from Michigan and we did some deep fishing, like Demiki rig fishing there. Um, and, you know, I've got some buddies that live up there. But, you know, from what I hear out of that part of Tennessee, which you, you're right, it's weird. It's a weird part of Tennessee because it is like its own little world up there. And there's so many lakes and so many, like, a ton of water to fish. I and mean, it's a very unique set of fisheries in the fact that they're deep. You got really deep banks almost all the lakes. Mountains that are flooded. Exactly. Otherwise. Exactly. And then you got trout, which the trout throws a wrench in everything that we do because when you got trout and you got bass, you start getting that California effect where you got a bunch of bass that are very keyed in on those trout. And I've noticed in trout fisheries, uh, Parksville being one, and Parksville is kind of where I'll probably refer back to as far as fishing those lakes too because I know Parksville, is those bass, when the trout get in the lakes, it's like they disregard everything else. And I don't know if it's just because the trout are stalker trout and they're not, you know, move as fast and they're not as, you know, I don't know, efficient in their environment or what it is. But when they decide to key in on those trout, man, it's like, it start turning, number one, it turns them into giants. But then number two, they get so centralized on those trout they don't want to do anything else. And that's where, you know, your big giant glide baits, your big swim baits, stuff that's going to do a really good job of mimicking those trout starts to come into play. And uh, all the guys I know that fish up there, they're drop shot wizards, the Ned Rig wizards, and then they've always got a giant bait on the front of the boat that they're willing to hook out there and just you know, swim along. So, but, yeah. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah, I know, I know the trout are there, but I never thought about them as a forage base for black bass. Yeah. You know, but, uh, I know the, the, the strikers, people use a live, because yeah. uh, that guy took me a uh, uh, Taylor, Trey Taylor's his name, I don't know if he's probably not watching, but yeah. awesome dude. But he hooked a big old uh, rainbow trout on there, and we did a hook up with one big striper. Of course, it came off at the boat, but he was fishing live stripers there. Yeah. Uh, Pat Henry, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, dude, the trout men are amazing. Um, I'm very interested over the next, you know, 10 to 15 years to see what happens with a lot of these fisheries and what happens to the bass in those fisheries. Parks will be a very unique because that's a place that. We don't want it to do well because it's got the Alabama spots in it. You know, it's a very highly invasive species. But all at the same time, me as an angler, I'm kind of like, oh, man, just leave it alone. Like, let's just see what happens. There. Because you got spots that are eating brown trout. And you've got you guys stalking brown trout in the creeks. And Georgia stalking brown trout in the creeks that are flowing into these lakes. And they're flowing up into the Oconee system. And, like, you've got bass that are eating spots specifically that are eating trout. And um, if you look at like a lake like Bullard's Bard in California, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, World Record Spot came out of there, the World Record Spot weighed 15 pounds. So the freaks, I mean like, it doesn't make any sense that they get that big, but what it is is there they're eating coconut, which is just a type of trout. It's in, and so I think here we could see something similar happen, and Parksville's had the, the state record spot for like four years in a row now. And I really, truly believe it's because you've got these big Alabama, you know, Coosa River spots that are eating these trout that are five, six, seven inches long, and it's just turning them into balloon. So I'm very interested to see. I mean, Mountain Hill's another one. I've caught brown trout. I've hooked. I never actually got one in the boat, but I've uh, hooked brown trout on jerk baits, main lake on Mountain Hill. Um, you know, just slippery stalker ones. And so they're making their way out of the river down into the lake, and I think the, there's a really kind of unique bite to be had there. I've just not figured it out yet. And, you know, as soon as I figure it out, you know, and get it really dialed, I'll share the experience with everybody. But right now, my experience has just been they're there, and I know bass eat them. I think it's just a fact now of having enough time for them to really focus in on that forage, and it's going to change some fishers, man. I think we'll have something cool. I think we'll have something really cool. With That's exciting. Yeah. I get some questions. This is good. All right, let's see. Uh, Gigi is saying, do you see... 
the coming Asian carp invasion having a major impact on bass in East Tennessee? You know, talk to John about that. Last time I had him on the podcast, last podcast I did with John, I need to get back on, was literally like, you know, doom, gloom. And I literally opened the podcast and was like, all right, John, we're going to talk about doom and gloom, buddy. I was like, what's the one thing you're the most worried about? And surprisingly, it was the day of the And he said, you know, you guys are doing a fantastic job of keeping all that at bay. You know, you're installing the sound barriers. I mean, you know, the people, there's people that have taken it upon themselves to spend their own money to go out there and wrangle them things up as that one dude got 15,000 pounds or whatever and so man I honestly believe that there's such a conservation effort behind it and there's such an effort to preserve what we've got here I mean you've got companies like AFCO one of my sponsors they've actually got a shirt called the, uh, the Asian Park shirt and it's uh, all the proceeds of the shirt go to the fight against Asian Park on TBA Lakes and I mean, so I think that it's not as big as a problem as we think it is, and I think we're going to be able to get it under control. Under control. I think those sound barriers are pretty effective. Yeah. The preliminary results are showing that it's pushing those car back. So not as many. There's some that are going to get through into the locks and yeah. continue up, but it's it's a very very small percentage. So yeah. there's a lot of hope. Yeah. Because Absolutely. of that effort, thankfully. And, and man, here's where living on these tributary reservoirs is a blessing because. They're, they're not connected. There's no way. They, they can't, can't get through the yeah. dam. Yep. So Douglas, Cherokee, Norris, and all that upper East Tennessee stuff we just talked about, if they get there, it's because some jack wagon brought yep. them there and turned them loose. And don't be that guy, please. Oh like, don't. God. Like, I, I love catching fish, and, you know, and I love keeping fish every now and again, um, but don't be transporting fish, even largemouth from one lake to lake or spots from one lake to lake. And I've heard about guys taking them to Coosa River spots and having pick with and taking places. And like, I'm like, man, it just saddens me because one wrong thing, one wrong breeding pair, something to just get the ball rolling, it'll be a snowball effect. But 10 years from now, watch where I'll be dead and it'll be full of spots. You know what I mean? And we don't want to do that. Right. And so just don't do stuff like that. You know what I mean? And let's start eating them too. I mean, heck, we were talking about eating them earlier. I think if people start eating them, they'll, uh, they'll disappear real quick. Uh, Boone's also asking, what is your personal best smallmouth and how did you get into this format that you did? Okay, so personal best smallmouth came out of the great state of Michigan. Unfortunately, Tennessee doesn't hold that one. It was a 586. Oh, I got your feet on dude, uh, hey, okay. dude, hey, that's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm like, I'll tell you my story. Man. I want a six-pound smallmouth more than I can stand it, dude. I've been around so many. I literally caught, I can't tell you how many 580 to 580 and a half smallmouth. Man, and like, never tipped that six-pound mark. But yeah, so it came out of the great state of Michigan, um, Lake Huron, and uh, I, it. I caught him on a net rig. Yeah. yeah, bed fishing. So we found some bed fish, man, and uh, probably one of the craziest days fishing I've ever had. It'll be a memory that I'll never forget. Standing on the front of the boat, my buddy, Mr. Benjamin Novak, Novak, best friend in the whole entire world, best, you know, best man at my wedding. And we're standing there, man, and I'm kidding you not, we're watching smallmouth swim past us out of the deep water, coming up onto this flat to spawn. And we're seeing dust clouds where the smallmouth are actively making the beds. Because this water, man, is we're 15 foot of water and I can see the bottom clear as day. And these smallmouth are swimming around the boat, man. And like you would catch one and drop your net rig in the water, and you had to be careful because if you dropped it too close to the, a bed, one would swim out of gravity and start swimming off of your net rig. It's one of those days you were there. Yeah, I was like, time. dude, the moment, like, so will exactly, it'll never happen again in my life. Like, I'll never see anything like that again in my life. Probably one of the craziest experiences I've ever had. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, dude, it's awesome. And then the filming thing, man, I started my YouTube channel in 2015-ish, around there. Um, I had, you know, graduated high school in 2012. I was working, fishing, hunting, just, you know, doing what guys do, you know, dating Bethany and just living at home. And, you know, I thought, I really like to film. I like to edit. I like fishing. And I, one of the things that I was into as a kid was like motocross, like freestyle motocross. Ooh. And so like I would watch these guys, you know, like, you know, Dungey and, and Travis Pastrana and these guys, and they were out in the middle of the desert, and they're making these films where they're just jumping motorcycles. And it's totally going against the culture of like professional motorcycle riding. But like guys like Fox and the Yamaha were starting to notice these guys. And so I thought... You know, I want to do that with fishing. Like, I want to make videos about fishing in like, and my first like probably 40 videos, 50 videos with just like rock montages of me and dad catching fish. And like I would line the hook sets up with, you know, like the beat and all that stuff. And it's because in 
I wanted to create that culture. Like, I'm not into tournament fishing. It's not something I do. I do kayak tournaments every now and then just because I enjoy them. But I've never been into tournament culture. Um, I have, but I got got it. Yeah, I got got out of it. Um, I got out of tournament culture. I really love conservation and the biology and the ecology around everything, nature. You know what I mean? Really being a conservationist. And then two, I'm kind of counterculture. Like I wanted to be the guy who was like, I want to go and do really cool crap in the fishing world and not have to wrap my boat, wrap my truck, and you know, pitch a bunch of stuff on that. And so, started this YouTube channel, man. No, didn't know I could make money. Had no intentions of making money. Had no intentions of turning it into a business. And you know, stars aligned. Unfortunately, got lined up with a lot of people that told me, "Hey, you can monetize these videos. Hey, you can do this. You can do that. You can build a business." And like, still to this day, it's not about the money for me. It's about growing a community and a culture around bass fishing that is centered around learning how to fish, having fun fishing, and being kind of a counterculture to the industry. As well as now, I've turned this thing into really fortunately a small business. And I'm able to grow this business and have a lot of fun doing it. So it's, it's awesome, dude. I mean, like, I never thought I'd be sponsored by Abu Garcia. I never thought I'd be sponsored by Pure Fishing. You know, Monster Bass It's on Bethany's shirt over here. Um, it's a company that I own part of. AFCO sponsors me. And, I mean, dude, it's just, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah, man. All right, all right. So that's, that's all the questions. Uh, if you got any more to it, we'll probably... Probably let it fade out here unless there's somewhere else we want to go with all this thing. But my six, seven smallmouth came off of Cherokee Lake. Really? And I'm, man, I grew up, you know, wanting to be a bass yeah. fisherman. My dad's a really good bass fisherman. He's a, a club fisherman. Yeah. Uh, never had time to try to do it for money. You know, yeah. he fish on these uh, wildcat things and stuff. But um, anyway, fishing his bass club a while. And, and I, I don't know. This guy, Bill Hill, is his name. He's from Cock County. Great, great angler. And uh, took me fishing. He put a uh, hornet head. Or a roadrunner yeah, yeah. with a willow blade. Yeah. And we put a fluke on that thing, man. And he told me to cast it out there and rip it up and let it fall. I'm like, give it a couple jumps yeah. and let it fall down. Dude, that thing hooked onto me and pulled me around that boat. I, had, I thought I had a freaking shark on that yeah. thing, man, because it was unreal. And I uh, got that thing in, man, but I'll probably never catch one that big. But it was just one of those places. He put me on, he put me on, man. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And just thrilled me to death. Yeah. Yeah. You, get a, you get a pissed off smallmouth on the line, dude. Nothing like it, dude. Oh. Nothing like it. I mean, the best thing, one of my favorite things, and this is not a bite this time of year, but like February, March time frame, river discharge fishing, when they're really dumping the water out of the dams. Go down there, big six inch swim bait, dude. I mean, there's nothing like putting into a five pound smallmouth at four miles an hour on current, dude. I mean, like, that, and I, no, yeah, yeah, and I think that's where, I think next state record will come out of water like that. I think, well, you know, obviously the stack record is whatever, set back in the 60s or whatever. 50s. I, 50, I don't even know if that's real. I don't think if anybody knows if that's real or if it's not or whatever it yeah, is. Always. But, like, I think I think you'll see seven, eight, even nine-pound class smallmouth come from some of these damn discharges around here before before too long. I mean, you know, it's already happening on Pickwick. You know, these guys are catching eight, nine-pound smallmouth below Pickwick Dam. And so I think our dams are next, and there's some giant smallmouth. That's encouraging, man. Those are fun. All right, so a couple more questions. Gigi says, uh, what's the YouTube program called? So Alex Rub Fishing for Everything. So you can find me YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and then my podcast, which comes out once a week. Um, and then I'm putting out two to three videos a week on YouTube. And then I do a live stream every Friday night at 9 o'clock. Um, and it's all under Alex Rub Fishing. Uh, tune in tomorrow. We'll give some stuff away. We do raffles, raise money through the, the live stream, and give to stuff, and just have a good time. Man. That's awesome. So yeah, yeah, yeah tomorrow night. And, and let's see. Uh, have, have either of you ever been to Dale Hollow? Me, no. I have not. I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm not. That's one of man. Western, middle, and western Tennessee is like I've always gone east or southeast. You know what I mean? And it's like kind of fits into my style. You know what I mean? That shallow water, grass, power fishing yeah. stuff. Um, but no, I've never been to Dale Hollow. That's where that world record smallmouth came yeah, from back in 51 or 52. Yeah. I got a replica of it here on the wall. Man. It's just it's ridiculous to look at that thing and think, that's a smallmouth. Yeah. Good. What do you eat with like 11 pounds, right? Yeah, it's, if one more ounce, it would have been 12 even. I think it's 11, 15, yeah. if I'm yeah. not mistaken. I truly believe there's one like that swimming around here somewhere. It's just having the stars in line and running into it. You know yeah. what I mean? Cool. All right, if any more 
questions, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Man. Yeah, dude, this has been, this has been fun. Hey, it regards me. Like yeah. I don't bass fish really yeah. anymore, but you got me wanting to get out and try to Absolutely, fish. dude. We'll have to go hit it and go catch some, man. I love it. I love it. But hey, I want to thank all you guys for taking time out again to tune in, to come hang out with us, obviously. Um, I really do appreciate everybody and obviously the opportunity to come hang out with you, Matt, and just, just do stuff like this because this is what YouTube did for me and this is what is the coolest part about YouTube for me is getting to meet people like you, building relationships, tuning in with you guys and doing stuff like this. So I appreciate you guys and everything that you have allowed me to do. So it's really cool. Man, the pleasure is all ours and I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge because there's a lot of guys that don't do that. And please, please share your experiences with people, good or bad, help help people out. Yeah, and you know that's one of the number one questions I get is, man, I want to go fish, I want to go hunting, but I don't know how to do it. Can you teach me how? And man, I'll tell you anything, dude. I don't make a living doing this. You're not a tournament fish. It's not like you got secrets that you're trying to hide. I'm encouraging people to yeah. be successful. Hey, if anything, I'm making people mad because I'm unveiling the secrets they don't want them to know. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, and like ask questions, guys. You know, obviously that's what my YouTube channel is literally geared toward now, you know, it used to with the rock montages, but now it's geared towards educating you guys and entertaining you guys. And, you know, the podcast, the YouTube, there's so many great YouTube channel creators out there from all across the country, no matter where you're at. And, I mean, literally, you type in bass fishing, man, and you're going to get an explosion of information. Right. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, you know. But, hey, that's the experience, right? Go out there and experiment, get out on the water, because it's the experience on the water, time on the water. I can watch a thousand YouTube videos. But I've learned more from being on the water than I've learned anywhere else in my life. And so just go get out there. I mean, whether it's bank, boat, kayak, heck, I don't care if you're paddling a flamingo around. I mean, get out there and just go fishing. You know what I mean? Go fishing. I think we'll end on that, brother. Absolutely. Thanks man. again. Thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, at Alex Drug Fishing on everything. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Cam. You can get me on uh, Facebook, Instagram. I got the, the John the Baptist Beer Care thing. If you want to buy some beer care, holler at me. I'd love to sell you some. And uh, thanks again for watching.